Okay, fellow babies, welcome back to another episode of Pactor Factor on Sifted.net. I uh, just want to make sure that if you watch this on game trailers, which is no more, uh, you know that you have a home on Sifted. So if you want to start, you know, being part of a new community, we've got a pretty vibrant one. It's obviously small, but these guys are kind of intensely smart, uh, polite, respectful. You won't find any bad comments about Pactor Factor on Sifted.net. Um, so you're welcome to join. We'd like to have you. You can join for free for three days. Figure it out. And it's 10 bucks basic, 30 bucks premium. And decide if you want to do that for a year of uh, Pactor Factor and a lot of other great Sifted content. So we welcome you to join. Uh, let's get right to it. Our first question this week from Sifted comes from comes from Substance 104. With Microsoft showing an increased focus on bringing Xbox One exclusives to Windows 10, how much will this affect Xbox console ownership for this generation and beyond? If games don't sell well on the Windows 10 store, do you think Microsoft will release them on Steam? Yeah, that's a good question. On the store, I'd say probably yes. Um, I think that Microsoft the whole Windows 10 thing, I think, is less of a storefront than Microsoft wants your entire uh, device universe to be Windows 10. So, I mean, obviously, they would love for you to have an Xbox, a phone, a Surface, you know, and a PC all running Windows 10. And so, I actually think that, you know, they're bringing these exclusives to Windows 10 just to drive adoption of the operating system, which is, you know, a couple hundred bucks, and they make a lot of money. The, the software costs them nothing, you know, for each unit that they that is downloaded. Um, so they want the world on Windows 10, and they're trying to make sure it all works together. I think actually the much more interesting thing is what's going to happen with over-the-top TV, uh, because you know, you're getting over-the-top TV, and people are talking about doing it on iOS or on Android, uh, I think Microsoft would like to dominate that as well. So I think you're going to see a lot of push on content on Windows 10. Will it affect Xbox console ownership? Um, you know, exclusives matter, but as Sony is showing with the, with the PS4, brand matters. I mean, people love their PS2. They strayed away in the PS3 cycle because it was too expensive and it was behind in multiplayer and they figured it out and they caught back up in the PS4 cycle on multiplayer. It's not too expensive, it's a great box. Um, I don't think as many people bought the PS4 for exclusives as they did for the play PlayStation brand and that connotation of quality. Um, there have been exclusives but it's not exactly like you know Bloodborne sold you know 30 5 million PS4s because Bloodborne probably sold 3 million units. So no, I don't think people bought um, a PS4 for the exclusives. They bought the PS4 to play Call of Duty, you know, to play Battlefield, I mean, to play Destiny. And frankly, I think Sony did a better job marketing games like Destiny, like Star Wars that were multi-platform games, but they made them appear as if they were exclusive. And, it, and I think they've done a great job with kind of day one DLC, getting an advantage over Microsoft on Call of Duty, stuff like that, uh, that aren't real exclusives. So I don't know that Microsoft can do a whole lot to reverse the trajectory of the Xbox One. I do think integrating Windows 10 is just a smart thing for the Microsoft Corporation, and I think it'll work over the long run. Don't think it's going to affect Xbox One sales positively or negatively. So. I'm not sure, and I don't think going to Steam makes a difference at all. I mean, it's really all about the operating system, not about where you buy the game. I don't think they care if Steam is the retailer or somebody else is the retailer. Okay, got another question from Sifted from 16 Blocks. <laughs> Do you think Microsoft will enter the massive toys to life market via Minecraft and other franchises? Could this help skew Xbox One toward a younger audience and increase sales of the platform? Well, clearly the purchase of Minecraft, of Mojang, uh, who makes or who made Minecraft, um, was intended to skew younger. 
and you know if anything that Microsoft's done pretty poorly the last 10 years or so they just haven't had a compelling kids you know content offering um, they tried I mean gosh I, I I can never erase this image from my mind Ed Freeze who was kind of the head of uh, studios at Microsoft on stage getting all excited about grabbed by the ghoulies I don't even remember what year that was 02 or 03 um, Wow, did that game look like crap. And uh, Viva Piñata. Who can, who can forget that? Um, so they, they really tried hard. They really couldn't get it right. So two and a half billion dollars later, they own Minecraft. And Minecraft absolutely got it right. So uh, yes, I think Minecraft is intended to skew younger. The question is, do you need to be in Toys to Life? And... I would have said yes a year ago. I'm going to say now, now no. Um, I think that Toys to Life is a very saturated, mature market. Um, the market is probably about one and a half billion dollars a year in sales. That's a lot. And you know, I think that when the only game you could buy was Skylanders, Activision was doing 750 million. When Disney Infinity came in, you know, Activision with Skylanders is doing 750 and, and Disney was probably doing 500 and the market grew. When Lego Dimensions came in and the Disney Infinity title switched to Star Wars, the market just didn't grow. So Lego Dimensions captured some share and Disney Infinity Star Wars captured a little incremental share and Skylanders lost it. So who wants to be the fourth guy in there? And I get it, Minecraft's a real franchise. So no question, if they did it, they would sell a ton. Um, but, you know, short of, where did Pixelated Mario go? There we go. Short of making a Minecraft, you know, Toys to Life that looks like this, because I don't know if any of you guys have noticed, but Minecraft kind of looks like this. Um, short of doing that, and this is seriously the coolest thing I've ever seen. Um, I don't, I don't know that kids are actually going to need the toy. Now with that said, so I said no. The game changer here is HoloLens. And I don't know when that's coming out. And I don't know what it's going to cost. And so if it's coming out in Christmas 16 and it costs 100 bucks, yes, I think Minecraft leads with that. So you might not have toys to life per se, but you might. There might be something that you work into HoloLens, and again, I'm not sure how it's going to work. Because Minecraft is a great app for HoloLens. Um, it's crystal clear they're going to do uh, a Minecraft HoloLens game. And I think that's really smart. The problem is HoloLens is an extra thing to buy. And you're just probably not doing that for the five-year-old in the house who's playing Minecraft. So it's just, I'm not sure where we're going to go with this, but um, yes, Microsoft wants to skew younger. Microsoft figured out that every hardcore 18 year old gamer started out as a casual five year old gamer and they'd like to win as many of those over as they can. They're winning them over with Minecraft. I think they'd like to keep them for the rest of their lives. I think that's a huge advantage that Sony has had. Uh, because Sony won over a lot of people in 1995 to 2000. And if you do the math, you know, if you were a 12 or 13 or 15 year old in 2000, you're 27 or 30 now. They're, you know, they, they're keeping those customers and that's why the PS4 is doing so well. Um, Microsoft's a, a full generation behind them and the Xbox wasn't that great. So there are two full generations behind them and that just makes it hard to compete. So. Winning over the five-year-olds is smart. Minecraft will help them do that. I'm not sure Toys to Life is big enough to accommodate uh, a fourth entrant, but we'll see. Okay, we got a question from Sifted from Vox91. Do you feel that there's still a market between the AAA and indie markets where a developer can be financially successful? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I think that The, the way to think about games and financial success is think about kind of return on investment. So if you're going to hire, let's use like 
343 Industries, you know, 300 or 400 people to make a Halo game and work on it for three years, it's, it's going to cost you 100 million bucks of salaries to make that game. I mean, it is expensive. And so you got to sell, obviously, more than $100 million worth of product to make a profit. If you have six guys in a garage working on a mobile game, you probably can knock it out in six months. So let's just go with the same value for the people. So about $100,000 per year each. It's going to cost you about 300000 bucks, not $100 million, to make a mobile game. You don't have to sell very many downloads or generate very much free-to-play microtransaction. So there's always a way to be financially successful. The mid-tier you know, is really just going to be games that are like her story, that are just really interesting. I guess that's mobile, but, but really interesting games that people are coming up with that probably didn't involve that many people working on it. And I think we're very successful. So, you know, finding these, these games is the hardest part. You know, finding a market and advertising the game and promoting the game and getting people to know about it either on Steam or in a GameStop, it's hard. And you're probably not going to get a, a console publisher to publish your game if you're going to sell 100,000 units. They aren't going to waste their time. So yes, the answer is yes on PC for sure. The answer is yes on mobile for sure. Um, it's open question on console because the, the console manufacturers just don't want to mess around with stuff that's not going to sell very well. They don't want to overcrowd the platform with a bunch of tiles. Getting it as a download on PSN and Xbox Live, absolutely. And so you get a ton of those. And you know, I guess that would be like Unravel. You know, EA published it. I think that team is very small. You know, but it probably was still more than a year in development, but I think it's like 40 guys. So it's probably a four or five million dollar game to make, fifteen dollar kind of download, fifteen or twenty, but inexpensive, and I am sure that you know it's making money. I mean, there's no question that thing's making money. I think a lot of stuff on on the PlayStation Store and a lot of stuff on Xbox Live Arcade make a ton of money for the developers. So yes, there's a huge market. Our last question this week uh, from Sifted.net comes from Shadowist. How much of a success must the NX be to get back third-party support? Are there any other factors besides sales? What does Nintendo have to do? I honestly think this could be the best question I've ever been asked in my career doing these little podcasts. So, wow. Uh, Shadowist. Shadowist, it was a good question. Um, I think you worded it brilliantly. You said to get back third-party support. So that connotes that you know this, they've lost third-party support, okay? So think about this, I, I said this to another question too, think about the wife who finds out her husband's been cheating on him and she kicks him out, okay? That's how the third parties feel about Nintendo. They feel like Nintendo favored its own content over theirs, that Nintendo always outsells them on everything. So, you know, Nintendo games outsell FIFA or outsold FIFA on the Wii. Uh, the control mechanism was so funky on the Wii and the Wii U that the publishers tried first dumbing down their games and consumers figured that out. And so the experience wasn't as good. And who wanted to play Call of Duty? I remember Call of Duty on the Wii. It was terrible. It was like, why would you want to play it on the Wii? So you're getting a worse experience than your friends were getting on the Xbox 360 and, and PS3 at the time. And Activision felt like, this is screwing up our game. This is cheapening our game. We have to dumb it down. And so, honestly, the biggest problem with the NX is going to be how different it is. And of course, none of us know what it is. But Nintendo claims it's a whole new way to play games. So I don't know what that means. I don't know if that means mobile. I don't know if that means no controller. I don't know if that means you know you you will things to happen on the screen with brain waves and the NX reads them. I don't know. What I do know is, and I have enough confidence in Nintendo that that 
I believe them. Um, it'll be different from the PS4 and Xbox One. And if it's different, it requires a completely different game. And I don't think the publishers are going to do that. I think they got burned on the Wii. And I actually remember this. Back in 2006, John Riccatello, CEO then of Electronic Arts, very famously said, uh, Nintendo bombed with the GameCube, we're not supporting the Wii. A year later, the Wii's a phenomenon, and he said, oops, we're chasing the Wii. Two years later, they were like, this sucks, we can't sell anything, we're not supporting the Wii anymore. Uh, Ubisoft, remember Zombie U? Like, they learned their lesson. They, they were all in, thinking the other guys aren't doing it, we'll chase it. They're not coming back. So, so yes, uh, the, the factors that matter are sales. If the NX has 100 million consoles out there quickly, and if those people are buying a lot of software, publishers will do it. If it has 100 million consoles because it looks like this, or it looks like Apple TV, and you end up with 100 million $100 consoles, and everybody's buying you know, downloads from the Nintendo store, I don't think anybody's supporting it. So uh, my bias is Nintendo's done before they start with the NX. And only Nintendo fanboys will buy them. And by the way, I said that about the Wii U, thinking that there were 30 million of you out there, but there are 12 million of you out there. Because the 30 million, I know there are 30 million of you who have beat the shit out of me for criticizing Nintendo, but 18 million of you haven't ponied up the 300 bucks to say you're really a fan. You just claim to be, you, instead of spending 300 bucks, you spent 15 and you bought pixelated Mario. So, and you did this without a 3DS or a Wii U, or this, is this the 3DS? I can't remember this thing. It works the same for both. Yeah, okay, so, yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, Wii U. So you, you bought this because you have a 3DS, so you know, you're pretending you're a fanboy, but this is really cool, by the way. Yeah, you know, I forgot it was. Yes. It works the same, and no one's ever actually played it in a game, but yes. <laughs> so I think that was a really good question. What does Nintendo have to do? If Nintendo wants to be competitive with its, its peers, it's got to produce a, a console that's competitive with its peers. And it simply has not done that. I mean, the Wii was Blue Ocean, different, expanded the audience. That audience is gone. They didn't embrace the Wii U. They're not embracing the Xbox One and PS4 as much either. Um, there is a net loss in console sales. And they're not embracing the 3DS. The, you know, those numbers go down every year. Um, they are embracing mobile and tablet, and they're going to keep doing that. And I think if Nintendo wants to reach that blue ocean audience that doesn't own a console, it should consider putting its software somewhere where those people can play it. I mean, count all the AAA Nintendo titles that have been released for the Wii U. Five of them, seven of them. There's, you know, there's not five a year because they aren't that big. They aren't capable of doing it. And count all the AAA titles released for Xbox One and PS4. There are a couple of dozen a year and it's going to keep going that way. And you're right. The question is brilliant because if third party doesn't support the NX, it's done. That's it for this week's Pactor Factor. We uh, very much appreciate your patience sitting through these long videos on sifted.net because you're paying and you're getting it real time. Um, and we also appreciate your sitting through the ads on YouTube a week later because that's how we can afford to produce this stuff. Remember, if you join sifted.net, you get it first. 10 bucks basic, you don't get this show, but 30 bucks premium, you do for a year. Come on, guys. Uh, if you have a question, please submit it on Twitter at Michael Pactor, copy at Sifted Games. You can hashtag Pactor Factor. We'll actually figure it out. It just says at, at Michael Pactor and at Sifted Games. And we've been pretty much pulling all our questions from Sifted because membership there is, is active and pretty intelligent. But we will pull some questions off of Twitter as well. So love to read the questions. If nothing else, uh, I'll try to respond to you guys directly if you ask me a question. Thanks for joining us. See you next week.